The views expressed and opinions given by the individual hosts and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Z Talk Radio, its affiliates, or sponsors. Are you sitting comfortably? Then we'll begin. The Warren Exchange, with your hosts, Al Warren and Julie Hughes. Our subject tonight, climate change. And our guest tonight is Joseph A. Olson. He's been a civil engineer for over 30 years. He's written a book called Slaying the Sky Dragon, Deaths of a Greenhouse Gas Theory. And he's written over 60 articles for the Canada Free Press. But we'll get into this right after these words. You don't usually get a stock tip from a 16-year-old, but I'm here to tell you about a different kind of stock. It's called Better Futures, a stock for social change that's not about making money. Instead, you invest to help students like me go to college, which ends up making the future better for all of us. My name is Alicia, and I am your dividend. Invest in better futures with UNCF. Visit uncf.org slash invest. A mind is a terrible thing to waste, but a wonderful thing to invest in. Brought to you by UNCF and the Ad Council. didn't see it coming, but it came in a can. Now my sweet son's braid into a man. Mine too, and hey, we know just who to blame. When our sons have fun with women and misbehave. Kissing all the women and his chores aren't done. He was just my little sweetie, tiny fingers, hands and feet. He's now he's touching, kissing, feeling all the women because of To my love, took it down. I climbed a mountain and I turned around. And I saw my reflection in snow covered hills till the landslide brought me down. Oh, mirror in the sky, what is love? Can the child? Then my heart rises above Can I sail through the changing ocean tides Can I handle the seasons of my life Okay, we're back, and uh, I want to thank Joseph Olson for joining us here. Let's start out uh, with um, who you are and the work you've done on uh, global warming. Uh, I'm a retired civil engineer, and part of the requirements for civil engineering is two semesters of thermodynamics. Uh, first semester is called thermo, the second one's called uh, transportation phenomena. 
in order to qualify those for those courses, prerequisites included four semesters of calculus, differential equations, uh, analytical geometry, and a course called numerical methods, and then two semesters of sophomore physics. So this is a junior level engineering course, which is you know pretty intensive. It's as tough as anything you'd get in any physics program, but it's a lot tougher than anything it takes to get a PhD in climatology, and we'll get to that in more detail as we go along. Uh, when I first got interested in global warming, I'd been kind of studying it off and on for about five years, but when uh, Obama got elected and said he was going to pass cap and trade, I went, well, this is a violation of so many laws of physics and thermodynamics. Somebody that understands these other sciences needs to speak up. And so in 2008, when he got elected, I started writing editorials and sending them to newspapers. And every newspaper editor would send them back and go, uh, your information's just too technical. You need to dumb it down. And I'm sorry, but you just can't dumb down reality enough to make these people happy, number one. Number two, you keep providing them information that they'll end up booting themselves and claim credit for. And so it was obvious I wasn't going anywhere with that approach. I wrote an article called Hoax of the Century and sent it to Alex Jones at InfoWar, and he posted that article on April 13th of 2009, and that was my first major web post. Following that article, um, I did 30 articles at Climate Realist. A number of those were linked to other websites, including Climate Depot, and from Climate Depot, they were linked to uh, Drudge Report and Breitbart. In October of 2009, I had my first post at Canada Free Press, and I've written actually 60 articles at Canada Free Press covering global warming, uh, sustainable energy, peak oil, Big Bang, and everything you know about history. So basically, I'm one of those people they call a polymath. I've studied a, a wide variety of science for over 50 years with a college engineering uh, education matrix background and so it makes it pretty easy for me to understand complex subjects. So tell us a little bit about the books and your co-authors. In the fall of 2010 I was actually approached by um, a group of authors from uh, five different countries to uh, write a book called Slaying the Sky Dragon. My other co-authors one of them is Dr. Tim Ball. He's from Canada, and you've probably heard of him. He's been one of the more outspoken climatologists on the, the whole entire fraud. Uh, Dr. Martin Hersberg is a uh, Ph.D. Um, physicist and is also a certified U.S. Navy meteorologist. Uh, Dr. Charles Anderson uh, did work for Sandia Labs and... Um, uh, U.S. Navy and and did a lot of uh, uh, research into uh, infrared uh, spectrometry and measurements and holds patents on those. Uh, Hersberg also owns patents. And then Hans Schrader and Al Siddons are both uh, chemists, and I'm an uh, engineer. So that's the group that did the book. And there was a censorship controversy the day the book was released, wasn't there? One of my co-authors is Dr. Klaus Johnson. Uh, he teaches uh, numerical methods. He's a, a Ph.D. applied mathematician at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. And these are the people that award the Nobel Prize. The day that our book came out, he was censored by his university, and they said, do not teach the formula that's in this book because it goes against the uh, laws of uh, greenhouse gas. And I'm sorry, the laws of greenhouse gas are a, a crude hypothesis that are unfounded in science, and the laws of thermodynamics have been uh, proven correct since 1870. And so uh, we thought it was kind of odd. He wrote an article and put it up at his blog site in, in both Swedish and English. And I wrote an article at Canada Free Press called uh, Carbon Warfare Rules of Engagement. And that has a link back to his article. But basically, 
uh, what kind of book burning are we talking about where you can outlaw a mathematical formula that's been in use for 140 years and never proven wrong just because it conflicts with a, a social dogma? The book was released in November, on, actually on Thanksgiving Day. The e-book was released in the United States. And then following our book, uh, in January of 2011, a... Houston architecture uh, professor named Larry Bell wrote a book called Climate of Corruption. And I attended the um, inaugural um, introduction of his book at a True the Vote meeting here in Houston in January and, picked, and, and read his book and was invited by his publisher to write a review of his book but because I had paid for my own copy, I didn't want to write anything negative. And what's really odd about Larry's book is that he gives you 250 pages of interlocking financial agreements and, and misconduct involving uh, the former head of uh, Fannie Mae, Franklin Raines, and Al Gore in creating the carbon markets. And then he says... But is this all part of a pattern of corruption? He goes, probably not. And then he goes into about three or four chapters about why we need to have green energy and why peak oil exists. And I, I wrote Larry and I said, Larry, I'm sorry, but there is no such thing as sustainable energy. And we'll get to that portion of the green fraud in, in a little while. And I said, then there's also nothing about peak oil because hydrocarbons exist throughout the universe. And so... I declined to do a review of his book. Uh, another book that came out prior to that is called The Hockey Stick Illusion by Andrew Montfort. And uh, Montfort, uh, based on the work of uh, two Canadians, McIntyre and uh, McKentrick, they uh, did analysis of the Michael Mann formulas for creating the hockey stick that shows the curves of uh, up, up cycle of CO2 and temperature that, that are matching uh, hockey stick curves. And they, de they determined that using his, his metrics, you could put in any set of random numbers and it would automatically generate a hockey stick. And in order to make the uh, medieval warming period disappear, to give the handle of the stick a straight line, they chose two, three trees out of the whole entire world to cover a 50-year period. One tree covered 20 years and two trees covered 30 years. And, they, and he based all the temperatures on tree ring data. Well, tree rings have three factors that control tree ring growth. The first one is precipitation, which is independent of temperature. The second one is disease and predation by grazing animals and insects, which is independent of temperature. The third one is temperature, but temperature is a bell curve. And so if you have a bell curve, you have a maximum temperature and growth ring, but then if you go above that temperature, your growth rings get smaller because it's too hot and below you have too hot. So basically at any particular point on the temperature axis you can come across and unless you're at the apex of that curve you'll have two spots so you can pick whether you want to have a high temperature or a low temperature. Isn't that convenient? Mm -hmm. It's like if you want to create an artificial curve you base it on on a third degree factor of growth ring and then give yourself the choice between two available temperatures that meet that growth ring pattern. It's absolutely the most absurd excuse for science imaginable. I ended up writing 60 articles at Canada Free Press, and those are available if you go to my website under author's bio, it lists the first probably 100 articles that I've written. I've written about 150 articles. But following publication of our book in 2010, uh, there was an uh, interview with climatologist Michael Mann and Judith Curry. And Judith Curry claims to be a denier, and she's having a debate with Michael Mann. And it was obvious from the debate that this 
neither one of these parties had ever taken a class in thermodynamics because what they were talking about happening physically was impossible to happen. So I sent her a series of emails trying to explain stuff, and it was obvious that she was not going to be able to understand what we were talking about. And so I went ahead and called her office in May of 2010, and I said, Judy, uh, you work at a major university, Georgia Tech, and they've got a great engineering school. What are you doing this summer? And she goes, oh, I'm doing a sabbatical so I can study. I said, well, perfect thing for you to study would be to go to an engineering class and talk to the professor and audit an engineering class. And she confirmed that she went to a professor, and he agreed to let her audit the class at no cost, no homework, just show up and sit through the class and, you know, come up afterwards. You can ask me questions, whatever. I didn't bother her again until September of 2010. And when I called her in September, I said, Judy, how did the class go? And she said, I went to the first day of class. I didn't understand anything they were saying, and I never went back because I was too busy. <laughs> and it's like, okay, well, here we are five years later, and I'm sorry. Willful ignorance is no excuse for science. If, if you are not going to bother to learn what the other people's argument is, then you have no right to deny them the position of argument. And what we have now is a completely rigged debate where the government created and funded climatology. There has never been a private sector demand for a climatologist at all. We have squandered over $160 billion, and that started under Big Bush in 1988. Under Reagan, spending on climate research was $20 million a year. Under Bush, in less than four years, it ramped up to a billion, and all of the excess spending was for uh, climate endangerment findings. And if all you find is findings for danger, danger is all you're going to find. And so basically that's what we've had. And in order to keep the debate from actually swerving off into real science and to keep real scientists who took study thermodynamics from being able to enter in the debate, they had to have a segment of the debate population that is what's called control opposition. Just like you have a Democrat and a Republican party putting on a puppet show, they can continue to kick the can down the road in the same direction and tell you, there was nothing we could do because, you know, we tried to oppose the Democrats, and, and basically that's the way they manipulated this debate. They have a group of people who claim to be skeptics and were labeled as deniers, and I called them when, when I wrote an article. After, after she did this fake debate, I wrote an article at Canada Free Press called Non-Science Nonsense. And in that, I called these people that are claiming to be skeptics lukewarmists. And I call the the big warmest, uh, Darth Big Warmest, and I call me and my group of uh, fellow scientists the Obi No Warmest. And so, anyhow, that's basically how that got started. With these groups, like you're describing, was there a set agenda? Is this just about money, or what's the purpose of it? The the agenda on the part of the warmest is to create a carbon tax. And, and to force a carbon market. And so basically they're providing credit default swap insurance for a, a defective uh, uh, marketing, a commodity marketing. And at the time they were planning for uh, carbon to trade at $100 per ton and that's what it was when Al Gore and Franklin Raines, former head of uh, Fannie Mae, sold out their shares of uh, the Chicago Carbon Exchange and then when the United States failed to pass the cap and trade act and failed to ratify Kyoto, uh, the carbon market in the United States collapsed to three dollars per ton and uh, the Chicago Carbon Exchange, CCX, went off the market. So part of it is to uh, allow controls and taxation and restrict supply Basically, what they're trying to do is to substitute the precious metals backing for, for currency with something that they thought would be expendable, which would be fossil fuels. And that way they could, they could say, well, you know, we had no control over the massive inflation that's happened because we, the dollar is a petrodollar and there's less and less petrol in the world. And so we've just got this runaway inflation. So it's all been part of a... Uh, marketing scam 
the same as everything in Wall Street is. If you want to read a great article about how the um, credit default swap insurance happened um, and read The Great American Bubble Machine by Matt Tabahi, T-A-I-B-B-I, at Rolling Stone magazine. It's about an eight or ten page long article. He's written three or four follow-up articles that are equally as in-depth. And the amazing thing is he shows all this corruption on Wall Street, and yet the Rolling Stone can't turn around and go, my God, they created the same thing with the carbon market. The problem with the markets was that there was never enough manufacturing base to create a constantly expanding uh, market for uh, Wall Street. So then they added commodities, and then when commodities wasn't enough, they added a futures market. And when futures wasn't enough, they added derivatives. And when derivatives weren't enough, so basically they're just coming up with another casino game every couple of years in order to come up with another way of hoodwinking the public out of their money. And this allowed the EPA to have exorbitant expansion of uh, government rules and regulation. It destroys uh, private property rights and destroys uh, entrepreneurship and keeps placing more and more power in the hands of the monopolists. But in order to keep from having a debate that actually addressed the science defects, they needed to make sure that they had controls over two sides of a debate and, and make it about the degree of warming. Uh, the way I describe it is that you have uh, a defective hypothesis and you have two groups that are arguing about it. One of them saying carbon causes a whole lot of warming and the other one saying, oh no, it only causes a little bit of warming when in fact it's impossible to cause any warming and we'll get into the actual physics of that in just a little while. But what they're trying to do is to find the proper single parameter coefficient that can correct a defective hypothesis, and you cannot do that. Could you now explain the physics of carbon dioxide? So if we want to get to the physics of um, carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide is a combination of two elements, carbon and oxygen. We dig the uh, hydrocarbons out of the ground in the form of coal, and petroleum products, hydrocarbon products, and we burn those. And in the process of burning, we combine the carbon with the hydrogens attached to it with oxygen that's already in the air. And we create at least two times as much water vapor as we create carbon dioxide. So, because there's more hydrogen molecules, uh, hydrogen atoms in the molecule than there are carbon atoms. But in the simplest case scenario, uh, methane, you have four hydrogens and you have one carbon, and so you'll create one CO2 and you'll create two water molecules. So you'll create double the number of water molecules. But by weight, the carbon dioxide molecule is 27% carbon that you dig out of the ground and 72% oxygen that you take out of the air, which is already 20% oxygen. So what they claim is that humans produce 28 gigatons of carbon dioxide a year. Right. If you take 28 gigatons and you divide out the portion that's already in the air as oxygen and you come up with just the amount of carbon that it takes to create 28 gigatons, it's less than one cubic mile. So what these people are trying to tell you is that one cubic mile of human dug up carbon hydrocarbons burned with oxygen controls the temperature of a planet with 310 million cubic miles of ocean and 259 billion cubic miles of molten rock. The ocean has an average temperature of 4 degrees centigrade, which is just above freezing, and the uh, molten rock has an average temperature of 2,000 degrees centigrade. And there's no way that one cubic mile, and that's why I like to use that, that analogy. You can kind of figure how big a cubic mile is. Take a cubic mile and spread it all the way across this planet and then tell yourself 
that that cubic mile controls the temperature of the planet. It's absolutely absurd. So that's the, the thermal mass argument against global warming. And what about the temperature cycle argument against global warming? Can you tell us about that? Here's a temperature graph, and this is available online. What you have is the orange areas are areas where you have increased temperature. And this is what we'll just call a mean temperature between the highs and lows. Well, here you have the um, Myoan, Roman, and medieval warming periods. During these three warming periods, Vikings occupied Greenland. They built stone dairy barns that held up to 50 cows each. They left discrete artifacts from each of those occupation periods. And then they left during the Grecian cooling, the Dark Age cooling, and the Little Ice Age cooling because their dairy barns were covered with snow. And today those dairy barns are still covered with snow and ice. So I'm sorry, human beings over the last 2,500 years had no ability to control climate, and there's no change in carbon dioxide that could explain that because carbon dioxide is completely independent of these temperature cycles. So these are astronomical cycles. These were produced with the Milankovic uh, astronomical theory of ice ages, which was printed in 1914, and nobody's been able to refute it. This is how sunlight actually affects the planet, okay? Mm -hmm. The black line along the top is what's called the ideal Planck curve. The yellow line is the actual measured, which extends a little bit beyond, indicating that we have a little bit of, of an error with Planck, and we'll get to that later also. But the orange, bright orange, indicates the amount of absorption that goes to the surface of the Earth which is less than 70% of the sunshine that hits the top of the planet. Now, these are the absorption bands. You absorb in the UV range with ozone, which is O3. You absorb in a couple of bands with O2. You absorb in three bands out in the infrared with carbon dioxide. And all of the rest of this absorption, all of the rest of this yellow is water vapor, which has over 50,000 absorption lines. Uh, I sent you a wiki page on water absorption, and if you look at that page, it shows you the absorption of the molecules and how it, the water molecule, because it's not a nonlinear molecule, is allowed to absorb far more energy, and it actually has the highest specific heat of any substance that man has found so far, and that's the ability of the molecule to hold heat, and because it absorbs in 50,000 bands. So basically what you're doing is the atmosphere is filtering out 30% of the incoming solar energy, which is cooling the Earth, which is why the Earth is 200 degrees centigrade cooler than the hottest temperature on the moon, which the moon is the same distance from the sun. The orbit distance between the moon varies as it circles the Earth, so the average distance is always the same, but the, the distance, the 240,000-mile uh, distance that the moon might be closer during the... Uh, new moon phase of the uh, lunar cycle is minuscule compared to the 93,000 mile orbit distance from the the sun so basically we get the moon and the earth get the exact same amount of sunshine the moon is 200 degrees centigrade hotter than the earth and it's 75 degrees cooler than the coldest temperature on earth now this is one of the bibles of climatology. This is the Kiel Trendbirth chart. And if you look at this, they show 340 watts per square meter coming in at the top of the uh, atmosphere. They're showing out of that 161 reaching the surface, but they're showing 333 watts per square meter being brought back to the surface by greenhouse gases. So basically what they're telling you is the sun shines through your window, it heats up your floor, therefore glass heats your floor. Forget that the sun is the only thing that's providing energy. These gases are not providing energy, and they're not providing double the amount of energy of the sun. And if they were, they would have to include water vapor, 
because, as we just noticed, water vapor is the largest absorber of anything in the atmosphere, by far. Okay, well, what does water vapor actually do? When the sun shines on the ocean, it removes 2,274 kilojoules of energy for every kilogram of water. That's called evaporative cooling. If you put water on your skin, you can feel the water evaporate and your skin cools. That's what your perspiration does, is it cools your skin by evaporative cooling. If you put a pot of water on the stove and you put a fire underneath it, it'll get up to whatever the uh, atmospheric pressure allowed temperature is for that, which at sea level is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. When you get up in, in a mile high, say in Denver, it's only 180 degrees Fahrenheit because the atmospheric pressure is not 14 pounds per square inch, it's only 11. So you reduce your boiling point. But the fact is, you keep adding energy and the temperature doesn't go up unless you put a lid on it and force the pressure higher. And so basically, you're removing energy be, by change of phase. When it goes from a liquid to a gas, it removes energy. And that takes energy away from the surface of the ocean, and that energy goes up as water vapor to a high enough atmosphere that it finally condenses. At that point, it becomes water droplets. Water droplets are heavier than air. They want to fall down. The only thing that keeps them from falling down is that there is an updraft of air that is enough to hold them in suspension. I'm a, uh, at one time I was working on my private pilot license and I flew a Cessna 150 through a series of cumulus clouds. The top of the cloud deck was 7,500 feet, the bottom was 1,500 feet and I couldn't turn fast enough to get between the clouds. I was trapped above them and had to get below them in order to land. And in the process of flying through multiple cumulus clouds, I got a chance to uh, verify rain hitting the bottom wing and the bottom of the fuselage of the plane, just pounding it like, like a hailstorm. 200 mile an hour updrafts all the way through the middle of these clouds in order to keep them um, suspended in air. When you got to the solar facing side of the cloud, you could see the white cloud vapor just disappearing off of the face of the cloud. The cloud was constantly being eroded. When you came out underneath the bottom of the cloud, you could fly along and look up at the clouds and you could see the water droplets fall down and then just disappear and go right back up into the cloud. And so basically what a cloud does is it's transferring energy constantly from the surface of the earth up to the top of the atmosphere. It's releasing that as a convective current at the top of the atmosphere and then the water vapor is falling back down as droplets. An average cloud, and I've got here, you can go to wiki, I sent you that wiki page. Right. An average cloud has 10 to the 15 joules of energy which is 10 with 15 zeros after joules of energy. It weighs 15 to the 10 to the 8 kgs, which is uh, 16,500 tons. If you've ever noticed when a, a thunderstorm goes by, average thunderstorm is 20 kilometers in diameter. You ever notice when a thundercloud goes between you and the sun, it gets cooler? Right. That's because it's preventing that energy from getting past the cloud and getting to the earth. It doesn't warm the earth. Have you ever noticed that when it rains, it's never hot rain? It's always cold. Right. Have you ever noticed that occasionally uh, thunderstorms will actually drop hail and sleet and snow, yeah. which is all colder than the earth? And in order to, to condense water vapor from a liquid form into a solid form, you have to release an additional 334 kilojoules per kilogram. So you, when you go from a uh, hail or you go from, from a cloud that has water in it to a cloud that has hail or sleet or snow, you're re re releasing another 15-20% uh, of energy in order to make that change of phase. And so basically, if you understand thermodynamics, everything that they tell you about climatology is just a complete, utter fraud. And that's what I'm hoping to do today. I'm probably, I might be talking above some of the audience, but the way I look at it is 
I, I would rather pull on everybody's bootstraps and try to help everybody get more intelligent. The nice thing about this on a Skype interview is that you can see the visuals, you can do your own reference, you can do your own research on this, and you can come back and revisit this, this uh, video numerous times. And this is a, a free college education course. What I really want to do is I want to wake up the college students who are stuck in a climatology class or who are taking physics and end up arguing with their climatology professors or fellow climatology students about why this is such a defective, intentionally created false metric. Or this is 5,500K is what they're showing for solar temperature. Sometimes that's shown as 5,800K regardless. They're showing the Earth emitting infrared. Okay, anybody that's hot radiates infrared energy. Your body at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit emits energy in the 10 micron wave. Well, Earth emits in this infrared range based on the temperature range between 210 in, in Antarctica and 310 in, in the Sahara Desert. This is the profile of the Earth. But if you notice, this is 20 times larger than that, yet they don't show a temperature scale over here so they can make it appear that there's somewhat a balance. If you wanted to actually look at this scale, the sun does produce energy down into the infrared range that comes to Earth, and the Earth's temperature profile would be 1 20th of this bump, a little tiny little bump down here on this end. Now, what's important to note on this is you have three major absorption bands for carbon carbon dioxide. Those are temperature dependent. This one is 800 degrees centigrade. The earth never gets that hot. This one's 400 degrees centigrade. The earth never gets that hot. This one's minus 80 degrees centigrade. This is the only one that earth sends out. This is also completely absorbed by water vapor. This one is completely absorbed in the same range by water vapor. And because water vapor molecules outnumber carbon dioxide molecules a thousand to one in the atmosphere, this one is completely swamped by the 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide. When the college students are in college and they're taking these climatology courses, um, why is it they're not getting the correct information? Like, I, I understand from one point, you know, about the money and, and, and the things from government, but what about uh, college teachers? Well, there again, it's a completely controlled environment. And if your university stands to get uh, multi-million dollar grants from the government year after year after year, they're not going to allow you to get up and say, I'm sorry, this is alchemy. This is phrenology. This is fake science because that would end your grant stream. And so all of these professors are tied into federal government money and all of them are lying in order to continue the money stream. And they refuse to debate. The, the Darth Big Warmest absolutely refuse to debate the Luke Little Warmest. The Luke Little Warmest that I have met in person and have had at least 100 emails with include Richard Lindzen at MIT, Judith Curry at Georgia Tech University, Roy Spencer at University of Alabama, uh, and a number of others. But those, those are the ones that, that, I, that I have had the most argument with because they refuse to debate the no warmest. They say, I'm sorry, you don't understand climatology. And it's like, I'm sorry, I understand indeterminate structural analysis. I think I can understand climatology. One of the colleagues that's with our group, uh, after, after we ran into all these other problems, we decided that the, the defects are in the, the peer review group that is all PAL review, and that was brought out in the climate gate emails, that these people um, are willing to lie and suppress any alternative discussions and, and manipulate data and do whatever it takes in order to uh, win their particular arguments. So uh, we decided that we'd need to form a scientific society to counter their their power uh, and, and the omnipotent power of the Royal Society, the Nobel Committee, the National Academy of Sciences, and all these other heavily funded groups that are putting out this false uh, mind. And so we created Principa Scientific International. One of the uh, colleagues with that group is a uh, Houston area chemical engineer 
named Dr. Pierre Latour. Uh, Dr. Latour has a PhD in chemical engineering, holds multiple patents for chemical uh, plant processing controls. In a chemical plant, carbon dioxide is both a reactant and a byproduct. And sometimes you want it there and sometimes you don't, but whenever it's there, you have to know how to detect it. You have to know how it behaves chemically and thermally in order to be able to remove it or add it properly to your chemical process. I'm sorry, but if you understand how to work carbon dioxide in a chemical refinery plant, you don't have any problem understanding how carbon dioxide works in the atmosphere. And so one of the articles that, that Roy Spencer at University of Alabama wrote was, uh, yes, Virginia, cooler objects can make warmer objects warmer still because everything produces radiation. And so because you're getting radiation from an ice cube, it's making your body warmer. I'm sorry, Roy, that's wrong. When he published his article in July of 2010, I wrote an article saying rocket scientists need not apply. And that's at Canada Free Press also. And I sent him a copy of it, and he said, well, thanks for notifying me about the article. And I said, well, it's just common professional ethics that you do not write an article about somebody else's work without notifying them that you are, are mentioning them. And Dr. Latour read uh, Roy's paper, and he wrote an article called No, Virginia, Cooler Objects Cannot Make Warmer Objects Warmer Still. I mean, it's just absolutely intuitive. It, can you take a mirror? Okay, your body's 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. You're emitting infrared radiation. Right. A gas molecule can't capture and throw that back, which is a point we'll get to again in just a second because that's another point that we haven't discussed on, on the molecular level about in, infrared absorption, but we'll get to that. Okay, you, you can take a, a polished surface like a mirror or a flat metal plate and you can reflect infrared heat. If you put an infrared heater in your, in your barn to warm things up, it won't warm the air, but it will warm solid bodies. And you can take a reflector and you can reflect that heat down and you can warm your body with an infrared heater, but you can't take your, because you have a, a large molecular mass that can reflect the, the, the infrared wave and you can get a 90, 95% reflectance. Okay, but what you can't do is take a mirror and hold it up to yourself and bask in your own heat because your body temperature cannot raise your body temperature. Right. Uh, in the 70s, there was a thing, a, a mylar sheet that they called the space blanket that was supposed to capture, oh, the Apollo astronauts use it. It's supposed to capture your energy and, and keep your body warm. And there were other companies that said, well, we want to go ahead and produce Mylar blankets too. And they said, no, you can't because this is a, a patented process. They ended up in the patent court and even a stupid non-engineered uh, trained judge said, I'm sorry, the, the plaintiffs have presented the information and it's impossible to show that the, that you can reflect infrared heat back and raise your body temperature. The only way a blanket works is by reduced convection, which is the only way a greenhouse works. A greenhouse works by putting a physical barrier to keep the heat from traveling out of the house. Glass is opaque to infrared. The infrared that comes in goes straight back out. You don't stop the infrared energy. All you do is contain the heat. And in a greenhouse, if you want to increase plant growth, you double the amount of carbon dioxide because plants use carbon dioxide. It is a fertilizer. They create carbon dioxide, sunshine, and combined carbon dioxide, sunshine, and water, and that produces photosynthesis, which gives us sugars, starches, and cellulose, which is the building blocks of all life on this planet. Uh, getting back to the 400 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere, there is a limit to the amount of radiant energy that's coming off of the planet, as we mentioned before. And doubling the amount of CO2 doesn't double the amount of available energy to absorb. Now, getting down to the molecular level, when you have a water molecule, and I showed you the wiki page with the absorption where you can see the vibration modes, a carbon dioxide molecule is linear. You have a carbon atom with an oxygen on each side. It's a 180-degree bond angle, so it's a straight linear. And so it only has one mode of vibration. 
When it hits the resonant frequency so that the oxygen molecules vibrate off the end of the carbon molecule, it makes the mo molecule more buoyant and it wants to rise up, but it also has a limit on how long it can hang on to that uh, extra kinetic energy. So when a photon comes from the sun in the 14.7 micron range that uh, that carbon dioxide can absorb in, or in the 4.3 or the 2.7 micron ranges, but the Earth only produces in the 14.7, but you've got three micron ranges. When that hits the carbon dioxide molecule, the molecule gets excited, but it only gets excited for a billionth of a second. After it has that vibration, it transfers that energy to the adjoining non-absorbing oxygen and nitrogen molecules in the atmosphere, and they vibrate. And so basically, you have something that picks up a little bit of vibration, goes, oh, 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 and then it releases a lower energy, longer wavelength photon. So basically, what the carbon dioxide does is it just filters out a little bit of the energy as it comes in from the sun. It's the same as if you took a tuning fork to a concert. You can hold up the tuning fork, and when the right resonant frequency hits that tuning fork, it'll vibrate. But if you took a thousand tuning forks to a concert, and you held them up, you're not going to increase the sound of the concert because the concert was independent of the vibrations that are happening inside the tuning forks. An increase in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere does not warm the planet, it cools the planet, increasing the concentration of CO2 because it has a specific heat of 0 0.8 instead of 1.0 like standard air is going to be a cooling factor. Every parameter of physics and radiation points to carbon, increasing carbon dioxide cooling the planet. But they have to hide that fact. Now, another colleague uh, of, of our group is a guy named uh, Dr. Pierre-Marie Robitaille, who is director of uh, radiology and director of physical chemistry at Ohio State University. His main interest is radiology. And because human blood contains 500 parts per million of carbon dioxide, which is uh, more than the carbon dioxide that's in the air, and, and you have to have that amount or you suffer from hypocapnia. You can't balance your blood pH unless you have more carbon dioxide in your bloodstream than is in the air. But with 500 parts per million of carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide had to be known at a very accurate level in order to increase the imaging for uh, magnetic resonance imaging. So if you're doing an MRI, you have to know the exact absorption and emission um, properties of everything that's going to be inside your uh, field of vision. Well, he started doing tests on this. He wrote, he did a great paper, and he's also done a great video called On the Validity of Kirchhoff. And in the process of measuring the actual properties of carbon dioxide, Dr. Robitaille found out that not only is Kirchhoff's law of radiation incorrect, but also the laws of Stefan, Boltzmann, and Planck are incorrect. And as a matter of fact, Planck had to put a carbon sample into every uh, spectro uh, analysis that he did, basically spiking it and creating a, a Planck constant that he got a Nobel Prize for that doesn't exist. And so basically, we've had a fraud in the way of uh, uh, radiation laws, uh, a Nobel-approved fraud, for over 100 years that we've been systematically lied to about everything in the way of properties uh, involving global warming by both sides of the debate. Yeah. So, you know, if nothing else, at least you can say, well, this guy is a credible witness that has spent an enormous amount of time studying the problem, and, and, and it is not only his opinion, it's the opinion of the 350 scientists that are also members of science, of Principal Scientific International, who agree that we have been lied to on this debate. And that group is growing larger by the day. I invite you to go to their website. Uh, it's principiscientific.org. Uh, read their um, publications page. We have peer-reviewed experiments that prove that there is no back radiation warming at all. And we have uh, 
a weekly newsletter that has probably eight or ten articles in that are selected uh, science uh, topics from uh, a wide range of science. But basically, our government lies to us about absolutely everything. And what about uh, peak oil? This bothered me from the time I took geology class. I I'm a civil engineer, but we were allowed to take two uh, non-engineering science classes in our degree plan, and I took astronomy and I took geology because I had interest in both of those, and they both served me well uh, during my whole life. But I had a real problem with the concept of fossil fuels, that the only reason there's petroleum on Earth is because of dead dinosaurs decaying and, and producing these uh, organic compounds. When you look out in the universe and you have the uh, Horsehead Nebula, which is bigger than a galaxy and it's nothing but a giant methane cloud. Well, where were the dinosaurs that did that? You look over at Saturn and there's a moon that circles Saturn called Titan that has liquid methane oceans, has methane clouds, has frozen methane ice caps, and it never gets any warmer than minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit on Titan. Where were the ferns and the dinosaurs that created all of that methane? They actually have uh, uh, geyser streams of propane coming out of uh, various moons on Saturn. And so hydrocarbons exist throughout the universe. So I thought, well, somehow I've got to figure out, you know, just for my own curiosity, how the planet would produce um, petroleum. And I stumbled across some stuff. There was a um, U.S. Um, Yale professor astronomer named Thomas Gold, who was from Hungary, spoke fluent Russian. He plagiarized some Russian research on oil uh, production. And the Russians back in the, in the early 50s figured out that oil was being produced by decomposition of rocks. And, and their, their hypothesis was partly correct. And I was reading it, and I was going, well, this kind of makes sense. And then uh, in the uh, 80s, they drilled a, a deep well in uh, a peninsula in, in, in uh, northern Russia called Kola. And when they drilled down at, at that particular location, they got 42,000 feet deep, which is, you know, six, seven miles deep. The pressures were enormous, hundreds of uh, thousands and thousands of atmospheres of pressure. The ambient temperature was 350 degrees, and they were having to use oil as a drill driver because there was water coming in, and they actually ended up stopping because they couldn't get any drilling mud that could keep the well sealed because of water penetration. And they said, how can water exist at that particular temperature and pressure? And they said it must come as part of an elemental uh, molecule. So what happens is when you have a uranium atom, you've got 92 pairs of neutrons and protons. And then to give it the extra weight, you've got some extra neutrons stuck on. The neutrons and protons are the actual indivisible matter. They're the things that are indestructible. But when they're put together in a big glob like that, the glob is, is breakable. And if you go to uh, Wiki, again, I hate to reference Wiki, but they're the easiest thing to reference, and yeah. not everything they say is a lie. Uh, I'd say on Wiki probably 5 or 10% of it is, is lies and distortion, but if you know how to filter it out, you can look at Wiki and kind of get some basic guidelines of how things work. But they show the daughter cell, uh, the daughter reactions, nuclides, for the breakdown of a uranium atom. And there's 12 daughter reactions. So when you take a, a, a uranium atom, this big cluster of no neutrons and protons, and you hit it with a particle, it breaks down, and it will break down into a series of 12 daughters. Well, each of those daughters under high temperature pressure and particle bombardment will also break down into another series. And so basically, we have a universe where everything is trying to become hydrogen and helium. And that's basic laws of thermodynamics, okay? The Earth is constantly being impacted by solar and cosmic rays, and we're partially protected from those 
by a variable magnetosphere. So you've got variable particle bombardments, variable protection from by the magnetosphere, and you've got uh, nuclides that are nuclear atoms that are going to break apart at some point anyway. And we have this claimed, you know, uh, three three point eight billion do- uh, year half life for uranium. So Earth has already burned up half of its uranium supply, and we've got. Uh, 13 billion year half-life for thorium and we've got 700,000 cubic miles of uranium and we've got 1.2 million cubic miles of thorium so combined we've got 2 million cubic miles of fissional material but it's not a constant decay rate like they claim in your physics class because it varies with particle bombardment If you take uranium and you put it in a nuclear bomb, you can reduce the half-life to milliseconds. If you take uranium and you put it in a nuclear reactor, you can reduce half-life of that uranium to down to just a year or two burn cycle. So basically, by controlling temperature, pressure, and particle bombardments, you can have any array of byproducts as well as uh, any array of uh, half-life duration for the molecules okay now when you're producing smaller molecules those are called elemental when you take an atom and you break it apart into smaller atoms those are called elemental atoms under high temperature and pressure an atom will want to have the least amount of space and so it will find some other molecule I mean some other atom that it connect to and make a molecule and that way you can form whole series of molecules. So the Earth is constantly producing these particular byproducts, and it also, in those decay chains, produces a whole range of inert gases. And inert gases are called inert because they do not form chemical compounds. So if you've got helium, and you've got uh, argon, and you've got krypton, and you've got radon, you have gases that cannot be created by breaking apart a larger molecule because they don't form molecules. Those are only uh, origins of nuclear decay. And one of those, radon, has a half-life of 3.8 days. If you had a pound of radon, in 28 days you've got a quarter of an ounce. Yet they tell us radon is a problem in your basements because it, it's outgassing from the planet. So the only way radon could be coming out of the planet is if radon's just being produced like crazy in order to seep up through the uh, cracks of the earth before it actually breaks apart. So that that's another factor that's completely absurd. Right. Now, in the process of producing all this heat and gases, you have a planet which is... 70% covered with water. The continental portions of the planet are at most 40 miles thick. Beneath that, it's molten rock. Okay? All along the edge of the Pacific, you have the Pacific Rim. Down the middle of the Atlantic, you have the Mid Atlantic Ridge. Okay? Consider these like, like lids on a, um, a pot. And the lid will sit there, and it will apply a little bit of pressure to keep the, uh, the gas boiling underneath the pot, but it will constantly be outgassing along the edges. And that's what happens along the tens of thousands of miles of continuous volcanic ridge that happen to be between 3,000 and 7,000 feet below uh, sea level. At that particular point, the temperature and pressure of the ambient water is enough that all of the gas molecules that come out will come out and immediately convert to a liquid's phase. So if you look at the uh, remote control um, robots that are circulating in front of undersea vents, you'll see gas just pouring out of these vents and then it disappears. The gas, if you put a thermometer right at the vent, is 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. You pull it back two or three inches away from the vent, it's four degrees. What happened to that gas? It immediately converted to liquid, and there again, just like we talked about previously with the atmosphere and and the ocean, you have the change of phase causes a cooling. 
You're basically constantly bubbling all over the planet gases which keep the entire ocean at maximum saturation level. Uh, I was wondering why these remote control robots had to have real slow propellers. And the reason why is if the propeller goes too fast, it breaks up the, the entrained air, which happens in uh, hydraulic systems, and we studied that in fluid dynamics, um, and that's what causes cavitation in pumps. Because you, you get the entrained air, when you, get, when you start stirring it enough, the entrained air breaks loose, and that's why at every level, all the way down to 20,000 feet below sea level, at the very bottom of the ocean, you spin a propeller fast enough, you'll bring gas molecules out. The bottom of the ocean, uh, by one uh, report by a, a geologist in uh, Australia named uh, Timothy Casey, the bottom of the ocean has vast pools of liquid carbon dioxide. That's where 90% of the, ox the carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere comes from, is being outgassed from the ocean. The claim that the oceans are going to acidify because of human carbon production is absolutely absurd. You cannot force carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into a carbonated beverage like a beer or a champagne or a soda pop because there's more carbon dioxide in the fluid and once you relieve the pressure it's coming out of the fluid and the same thing with the oceans they're constantly being filled with a whole series of gases which is not just carbon dioxide it's also sulfur dioxides uh, nitrous oxides all of the by all of the gas byproducts from the fission reactions that are going on in the center of the planet are being outgassed along the edge of that lid along the ocean level at depths and temperatures that immediately convert them into liquid. They come up inside the water column. At a certain point, they reach their saturation temperature, and they convert to bubbles in the water, and then they outgas into the surface. So basically, there is no carbon dioxide flow from the atmosphere into the ocean. Now, another claim by these climatologists is, uh, oh, we're going to cause ocean acidification. Oh, really? Well, the pH of neutral is 7.0. The pH of the ocean ranges from 7.8 to 8.4, which is heavily alkaline. The whole ocean basin is covered with basalt, which is, uh, is calcium carbonates, which if you happen to get the slightest amount of acidity going, they, they're going to dissolve and neutralize it. So the claims that carbon dioxide is going to acidify the ocean are as absolutely bogus as every other claim by these climate charlatans. How would you bring that down to someone on the street? Um, because what they hear from the media is something different. You need to... Um, there was an, a wonderful thing in, in physics when you're first getting started doing your dynamics thing. It's called uh, inertial reference plane. And that is that that there's there's no perfect place for looking at anything. So what you need to do is you have to just mentally say, okay, I'm going to forget everything I quote know under the under the possibility that you've been lied to about everything. And then I'm going to listen to what Olson and the other scientists that he's referenced to are talking about, and I'm going to absorb a completely independent viewpoint and then after I have studied enough of this independent viewpoint I'll compare it to what I've been force fed and see which one has more credibility. The wonderful thing about science is that it's empirically proven. Science is quantitative, it's predictive, and it's repeatable. Anything less is superstition. So if you can do an experiment that proves something, and and it not only proves something, but you can say, the next time I do this experiment, this is what's going to happen. And somebody on the other side of the world can take the same test equipment and do the same experiment and come up with the same thing. Then you have science. Global warming is not science. There has never been an experiment that proved that any of these false hypotheses that they claim about radiation, about heat transfer, about um, 
the, the behavior of clouds. Everything that they state is a complete falsehood. And we've, we've gone through a series of those so that even if you don't understand the nuances and the minutia of it, you can understand the overall concept. Our government lies about everything. 95% of the news media on the planet is owned by six monopolist corporations. They own our government. They own our major uh, scientific uh, organizations, and there is not an ounce of uh, objectivity allowed. They have an agenda, and their agenda is to create a um, universal serpent. These people are demonic warlords, and there's no limit to the amount of lies that they will tell us. So we've already discussed a pretty good range of lies involving uh, global warming, uh, and then we were just getting into the, the uh, discussion on uh, peak oil and the, and the fallacy of uh, the limited finite supply of oil. Uh, the first oil well was drilled in Pennsylvania in 1859, and immediately the U.S. Geologic Survey said, well, it was only 150 feet deep, but this well is going to run out in no time. The great thing about that oil well is that it produced kerosene, which eliminated the need for whale oil. And so the very first products were, were to provide light for the other humans on the planet. And since then, the reason there's oil under every, every rock you frack is because the oil is constantly being produced. The article that I wrote at Canada Free Press called Fossil Fuel is Nuclear Waste was published in September of 2010. Um, it was a unique title, and when you put a unique title in with quotation marks, you can get the exact number of Google postings for that article. My article had 11,000 crosslinks in one day, and I went through the first 100 pages, which was the first 1,000 crosslinks, and I wrote down every foreign language that I could identify. I was in 25 foreign languages. The first article I wrote at Canada Free Press was called One Pleasant Day in Runnymede. And Runnymede's where the uh, dukes and barons of uh, England forced King John to sign the Magna Carta in 1215 AD. That article in three hours had 110 crosslinks and it was in Thai, Japanese, Korean, Belgian, French, and English. And I only speak English. So basically the internet was just this enormous tool that was able to put information out and people were able to assimilate that information, translate it, and share it with people that I had no chance of knowing. Okay, well, this ended up being a problem for the ruling elite. And on May 9th, 2010, uh, Obama called uh, Eric Sch Schmidt in, the CEO of Google, and said, man, we've got a problem with this internet giving people, you know, all these alternative viewpoints and this alternative information stream, what can we do about it? And he goes, oh, no problem. We'll change our Al Gore rhythm and make these people disappear. On May 9th, after their two-hour meeting in the uh, Oval Office, Obama walked out to the Rose Garden, looked at the, can at the teleprompter and said, too much information is dangerous for our democracy. So me and Mr. Google are going to resize the web. That night, I had 250,000 crosslinks under my name, Joseph A. Olson. The next day, I had 10,000 crosslinks. The next day, I had 900 crosslinks. They managed to make me disappear on the web because they didn't like my message. And right now, net neutrality is going to do the same thing. This program will end up being sidelined somewhere where you'll never see it. Obama was so proud of himself that he went to three college commencement exercises that week, one at Howard University, one at Hampton University, and one at East Michigan University, where he got up with his fancy you know, robes and sashes on and told these thousands of college graduates, too much information is dangerous for our democracy. And hundreds of kids held up their cell phones 
took pictures of him saying that and posted it on YouTube. And today, you're lucky if you can find one copy of that because they purged it off of YouTube. But that's exactly where these people are going. These are fascists that have complete control of the system, and they have no uh, moral restrictions on telling the truth about anything because they're invested in a, a, a group of corporate lies. And what can you tell us about sustainable energy? Um, there is no such thing, really, as sustainable energy. Um, the one that I started researching the earliest was photo cells. And I, I thought, my God, how do these things create electricity out of just sunshine? There, there, there's got to be some magic involved. And you can't find any place other than the articles that I've written on it and as to how a solar cell functions. But if you've taken a chemistry class and, and you've taken a geology class and you understand how matter works, you can understand how they manufacture them and then you can understand actually what the mechanics are. So what you start off with is a, a crystalline grid of silicone. Now silicone wants to form a cubic crystal. So basically, just think of it as, as like a, a cubic lattice, three-dimensional lattice, okay? So this gives you a, a square framework to work with. Now, you make it slightly impure, and then you wash the impurities out of it. Into that, you add an element that has an extra outer shell electron, in this case, a boron uh, atom, okay? Now, that boron atom has four electrons in its outer shell, but it also has a fifth electron that circles around that it can't hang on to real well, and it will give it up if it needs to, okay? Then, in order to allow that electron to move through the solar cell, you also need something that has a hole in it to allow the electron to move through the hole, and that you need a little bit of phosphorus because it only has three electrons in the outer shell. So you take silicon that has a balanced four in the outer shell, you take phosphorus that has five with an extra one that can barely hang on to. You put a little bit of phosphorus that can move through it. And then you put it out in the sunshine. And basically what you do is you let the sun heat that molecule up to the point where it loses that electron. That electron leaves the solar cell and produces one and a half volts of direct current at about one watt per square foot. Okay? So what does that mean? Well... It's direct current, which means it leaves and it never comes back. The electron leaves the solar cell. So you, what you're basically doing is molecular erosion. You're digging elements out of the Earth that, when exposed to sunshine, will give up an electron. But they only get to give that electron up once. It's not a, a mechanism that sits there and keeps working year after year after year. Solar cells have a maximum life of 20 years. At that point, there's nothing left to be stripped out of them which is why they have to be constantly replaced on the space stations, which is why you're not going to put solar cells up in, in orbit and beam infrared energy back to Earth and solve Earth's energy problem because it takes more energy to dig up the silicon and the phosphorus and the boron it takes to manufacture the solar cells than you ever get out of a solar cell. If you're producing one and a half uh, volts of direct current you need to convert that to alternating current in order to be able to transmit it because the, the uh, voltage drop is tremendous, which is why Edison lost out to Tesla with direct current and alternating current wars in 1880 in New York City. And at that point, no place in the world has direct current supplied. It's only used for batteries in limited locations, like in your automobile. You have a, a chemical storage battery, and basically a solar cell is nothing more elaborate than a chemical storage battery. You can dig lead and sulfur out of the ground, and you can make uh, sulfuric acid, and you can put it in lead, and you can put a zinc anode in there, and you can create a battery, but you're never going to get enough energy out of that battery to go out and dig up all the material to build another battery. So you have a net energy loser. A solar cell 
I don't know the exact number because they keep this stuff classified. And honestly, once you realize it's a ripoff, you don't have to know how much of a ripoff. My estimate is that you probably never get more than 10% of the energy out of a solar cell that it takes to create a solar cell. One horsepower is 770 uh, watts, which if you're getting one watt per square foot, that means you need to have a 700 square foot solar cell in order to produce one horsepower. And if you've ever looked at any mining equipment or you look at any refining equipment or you look at any industrial processing or you look at any uh, ocean cargo ship that carried this stuff across the ocean, you think how much horsepower it takes to, to uh, dig and refine and mine and process and distribute those things. It's absolutely absurd. And then you're stuck with something that in the wintertime, you get a high azimuth angle in a, in a location like Canada, you don't get enough incident sunshine for four hours a day to produce any electricity at all at the time when you need it the most. And that's if you don't have a cloud blocking the sun out or you don't have snow piled on top of your stupid solar cell or you don't get it impacted and break the glass with hail or blown wind. You know, the whole thing is absolutely absurd. Uh, another typical example of how absurd sustainable energy is, is biofuels. It takes 100,000 BTUs of fertilizer, planting, irrigation, harvesting, processing, and distributing to produce one gallon of ethanol that has 80,000 BTUs of energy in it. So already you've lost 20% of the available energy. You you're, have a net loser to produce biofuels. Then you turn around and add 80,000 BTU per gallon ethanol to uh, gasoline, which has 110,000 BTUs per gallon, and you reduce the energy content of gasoline and you reduce your mileage by 15%. So how intelligent is that? We're going to waste 20% of our energy to produce a fuel that you can add to your car and reduce your gas mileage by 15%. This, this, there's, there could be nothing more transparently corrupt than a government that goes to Iowa and says, you help select the president and we'll make sure that you got a, a corn subsidy so that you can buy more Monsanto GMO garbage corn so that you can produce more ethanol so we can waste more energy producing ethanol than you ever get out of your stupid ethanol and we can ruin everybody's engine in the process. It's absolute insanity. So when we talk about the government being corrupt like that and, and fascist, I mean, I don't think it started with the current government. It didn't start with oh, Obama. No, it's, no, it started no, no, before. No. So how how do we get ourselves out of that? Okay, fractional reserve banking was created by the Rothschilds in 1694. Right. And if you read a book called, um, and I didn't bring that one up here with me, great book called "The Creature from Jackal Island" by G. Edward Griffin. Okay. Uh, what the goldsmiths of, of uh, Europe figured out was that people were afraid to keep gold in their own homes, and they would rather have it in a guarded location in a, in a heavily protected safe, so they would leave their gold at their goldsmiths, and the goldsmith would give them a certificate stating that they had so much gold on deposit. Well, it was a lot easier to carry around a gold certificate and prove who you were and, and keep your ownership of your gold, but the bankers realized that that uh, less than 10% of the gold was ever going to be in circulation. So they allowed themselves to print 10 times as many gold certificates as actually had gold on deposit. And basically that's what they did to the Federal Reserve when they took over in 1913, is that they took over control of the American banking system. They immediately, under FDR, took us off of the gold system. Under uh, Nixon, they took us off of silver. So we had no underpinning for the financial uh, structure of the world. And what they intended to do was to switch it over to petrodollar, which they thought was going to be a constantly decreasing uh, resource. And that way they'd have a built-in inflation base for their monetary system. But that's where the fraud for all of the science, all of the government, all of the wars come from. It's from the banking fraud. And if you want to see an excellent video on that, uh, uh, Michael... 
uh, Riviera has a, uh, v, a DVD or a, a YouTube video, 45 minutes long, called All Wars Are Banker Wars, and I highly recommend that. Uh, in order to perpetrate these frauds perpetually, they, the uh, ruling elite figured out that if they own the war industries, they can uh, control a good portion of the budget, and they can also control the population because you can draft people, you can pass uh, espionage laws and censor people, you can uh, shut down newspapers, you can, you can control all the media, you control all of the government because you're in a wartime crisis situation. And so basically they've been able to keep humanity in constant warfare for the last 300 years. Um, the United States, when we were first formed, wanted to be completely independent of the Bank of England, but we ran up enormous debts and we couldn't trade with anybody until we settled our debts, so we created the first bank charter. And Hamilton, Alexander Hamilton, was set up by the Rothschilds to be their uh, little puppet in America. And they created the first bank charter and it lasted 30 years. And when it expired, America said, look, we've got all this land, we've got all these resources, we can produce our own, you know, products, we don't need to have England anymore, so we, we're not going to renew the bank charter. Well, that's when England declared the War of 1812 on us, was to force us to have another bank charter, the second bank charter. We technically had a stalemate in that war, but because we ran out debts, we went ahead and signed a second charter. Then Andrew was at the point where that charter was going to be expired, and he said that he wasn't going to renew that type of banking system and keep America in debt. And at that point, they set about structuring the Civil War, which was pretty easy to do because we had England, who was the main supplier of um, manufacturing goods in the world, and they also had the world's largest navy and the world's largest shipping fleets. So they could amateurize their costs based on uh, worldwide volume, and the United States had uh, beginning industries in shipping and textiles and manufacturing, but we were also a large base of uh, agricultural products, in particular cotton. And in a sailing environment, cotton was one of the most critical things you had to have. You needed it for rope and you needed it for sailcloth. And so England could, could um, subsidize their textile industries and use high quality southern cotton and compete against American shipping and they could also use that money from other colonies around the world to subsidize their manufacturing goods and keep the north from manufacturing. So basically the north outnumbered the south two to one. Uh, they outnumbered us in, in the number of states in the union so they had complete control of the government and they were under control of, at that point, American bankers who'd also been funded by the Rothschilds, which included the Morgans and Rockefellers. Okay, so this banking group um, set about passing laws where they would do export taxes on southern agricultural products, tobacco and cotton, and they would do import taxes on finished goods, which would be textiles and uh, manufacturing brought in from England, and they would also require U.S. shipping. So basically, they were trying to use taxes on the Southerners for cotton and tobacco, and then taxes on the Southerners for anything that didn't come from the North in the way of manufactured goods and in the way of shipping. And so the the south was being constantly built out of tax money by a government that they had unequal representation in so we were manipulated into world into the civil war by the banking interests of the north which were puppets of the uh, rothschilds out of england okay uh, world war 1 was absolutely a bankers war you fund both sides of the of the war and then one side's going to lose but if you're a banker and you sell war bonds, you get something for the war bonds, and the people that bought the bonds either end up with war bonds that they barely get paid off, or they end up with worthless junk. 
A perfect example of this was what happened uh, in the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, the Rothschilds, the head Rothschild in England had five sons. He placed one in each of the royal courts in England, in Europe, which included one in uh, Austria, one in Italy, one in uh, France, one in the UK, one in Prussia. They were able to manipulate these monarchs and keep Europe in constant warfare. And when they had the war uh, in 1815 at Waterloo, the British won at Waterloo, but Rothschilds owned the London Times, and the Rothschilds also uh, were heavily invested in the bond uh, war bond industries and had created the bonds and sold the bonds, and Lord Worth, Worth Rothschild was uh, in the House of Lords. Uh, he had a spy at the Battle of Waterloo who got the fastest Pony Express horses and the fastest um, – sloop across the channel and got to uh, London, and they produced a, a special edition, All is Lost, Wellington Defeated at Waterloo. And they, they did a special edition, evening edition of the London Times, distributed all over. The, the value of war bonds went from a pound to a penny. He bought as many of them as he could, and two days later when the actual news got there that, oh, no, I'm sorry, Wellington did win. They, the London Times published a retraction, and Rothschild admitted that he tripled his fortune in one day. So there you have a perfect example of massive pumping and dumping, and that's what the whole entire system is. If you read the Matt Tabuli article on the Great American Bubble Machine that I uh, referenced earlier, if you read any of the texts that I've mentioned earlier, uh, simple things would be to, to look at the video, All Wars Are Bankers' Wars. Uh, um, Michael uh, Rivera covers those issues in, in a 45-minute long video where you don't have to actually – you know, sit down and read a, a thousand pages of, of written material and try to remember it. You just watch the video and it's pretty transparent what's been going on. In 1914, Morgan owned the Lusitania. He was filling the Lusitania with Morgan and DuPont war products in New York Harbor. Germany, 30% uh, of the people in America had German heritage. Either they were directly German or they had you know, German relatives. So there was plenty of Germans in America in 1914, and they had spies in the New York Harbor, and they reported to the German embassy, and the German embassy posted a notice in the New York Times, do not sail on the Lusitania. This boat is being filled with war material. The Lusitania was actually built as a light cruiser in violation of uh, naval treaties and had everything in place for internal magazines and gun mounts and everything. All it had to do is just take off the teak wood decks and they could convert it immediately into a cruiser. But they wanted to get America involved in the war. There was 180 American passengers that didn't uh, take heed of the uh, New York Times notice that got on that boat, and when it got to the Irish Sea, the uh, director of the Admiralty in England was Winston Churchill, and he sent a radio message to the Lusitania to go to half speed in the middle of broad daylight in the Irish Sea and for his uh, uh, destroyer escort to leave the Lusitania by itself. So already the Lusitania was going at half speed. The Germans at that point had 18 submarines. Now, the logistics of a submarine back then when they were diesel-electric submarines was that you couldn't keep a submarine out on station more than a third of the time. So that meant there was only six active German submarines in 1914, and one was known to be in the Irish Sea. Lusitania was hit with one torpedo in a forward hole. If you hit a passenger ship with a torpedo, the only way you can make that passenger ship explode is if you hit the boiler. The boiler was not in the front bow of the ship. The boiler was in the rear. I happened to be taking scuba diving training in the early 70s, and I subscribed to Skin Diver magazine. And they had an issue that said, uh, first exclusive photos of the uh, wreck of the Lusitania. And sure enough, 200 feet deep in the Irish Sea where it had sat there for 60 years was the Lusitania with blatant 
demonstration, photographic proof of internal explosions bending the, the plates of the hull out so that there was an inside explosion and the whole seabed was littered with munitions. There was artillery shells and mines and bombs all over the place around the, the bottom of the ocean. Skin Diver Magazine was going to do a second uh, visit to the site and publish more photos, but the Royal Navy sealed it off as a navigation hazard and dynamited the Lusitania wreck in February of, I don't remember, 1972, something like that. And so why would the Royal Navy declare a historic war artifact like the Lusitania a navigational hazard when nobody even knew where it was for 60 years and it hadn't bothered anybody, but that the whole ocean was littered with uh, war debris proving that that – uh, the Germans were correct when they stated, and that's why the United States didn't get sucked into World War One in 1914 like they wanted to. They had to worry, wait for another series of events, which they also carefully constructed, just like FDR knew three weeks ahead of time that the Japs were going to bomb Pearl Harbor. You know, it's just like uh, uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson knew that the Gulf of Tonkin didn't happen. The uh, Israelis' attack in the U.S. Liberty in the Mediterranean was a false flag that was intended to be pinned on the Arabs. Uh, JFK uh, was set up by the CIA and uh, sandbagged on multiple issues, including the Bay of Pigs, which George Bush was heavily involved in. Uh, a, a, plan called Operation Northwoods, where the U.S. CIA was going to shoot down an American passenger plane uh, near Cuban airspace and, and uh, blame it on the Cubans so that we could start a war with Cuba. Uh, the CIA was running an operation called Operation Gladio in Europe, where they were funding the army and supplying them with bomb materials so that they could create hundreds of casualties in Europe in order to uh, keep the uh, flames of war and, and oppression going in Europe. And so basically you had a CIA that was constantly creating wars and overthrowing governments throughout the world. And when JFK found out about it, he fired Alan Dulles. Well, Alan Dulles had been in the OSS during World War II, and he was appointed to head the CIA in 47, and he stayed in that position until uh, JFK fired him in 1963. He is a cousin of the Rockefellers. His brother John Dulles, also a cousin of the Rockefellers, was head of the State Department. Together, they made sure that Mao got plenty of weapons, that Stalin got plenty of weapons. The elitist uh, bankers in Europe found and funded Karl Marx. Uh, they found Lenin and Stalin and Mussolini and Hitler and Mao and every other dictator you've ever known has been found and funded by this group of monopolists because if you own the war machine, what you want is war. And that's all you do is you just constantly stack up these dominoes and kick them over and then, you know, you stage set and direct it. Uh, World War II, perfect example. 1943, July 25th, the Italian army revolted and captured Mussolini. They held him prisoner for six weeks. They begged the Allies to let Italy switch sides. At that time, Patton was already on the uh, Italian peninsula, and the Italians said, look, we've got a big line of mountains down the middle of Italy. We can put all the Italians on one side of the mountains, and, and fight the Germans on that side, and you can come up the other side, pick whichever side you want. We'll be more than happy to help you uh, do this. There's 900,000 uh, Italians on the Italian peninsula. There's a million Germans. We'll help the Americans beat them. The World War II would have been over two years too soon. So the elitist, absolutely. Eisenhower was a member of the Council of Foreign Relations. And Eisenhower had no interest in ending the war two years too soon. Uh, 
Patton had plenty of officers in his group that were Italian Americans. We had good dialogues with the Italians. Patton was more than willing to work with the Italians in Italy and overthrow the Germans. And we could say all the destruction that happened in Italy and shorten the war by two years, but that didn't happen. Well, Patton started making noises about it, and uh, so they sidelined him during the Normandy bloodbath, which was a completely insane uh, butchering of thousands of uh, uh, allied troops in an absolutely stupid uh, uh, demonstration of uh, infantry warfare. It just absolutely absurd. But after they got onto the uh, mainland of France, the Allied push stalled in Operation Garden, whatever it was that Montgomery dreamed up, was an absolute failure. So they weren't making any progress going through the northern part of France and into Belgium. And so they put Patton back in command. He almost immediately surrounded 250,000 German soldiers in western France along with all of their equipment. There was a 25-mile gap that kept him from being able to completely enclose these Germans and either kill them or force them to surrender. And that was a, a little town called Felice Gap. And he was under orders to not close that gap, to allow those Germans to escape. And those were the Germans that attacked us during the Battle of the Bulge. That German army and the, that German equipment was allowed to escape because had the war had had Patton captured them in July of 1944, the war would have been over a year too soon. So we don't want that to happen. And then uh, in December of 1944, Patton was a hundred miles away from uh, uh, Bastogne, and the Germans that had escaped uh, in Western France that summer attacked. And they were in the process of uh, annihilating 10,000 uh, soldiers of the 101st Airborne. And Patton was under orders not to relieve those soldiers at Baston. And he said, to hell with you. And they said, well, we'll not give you gasoline. He goes, well, that's okay. I captured enough gasoline from the Germans and French. I'll just use that. And so he relieved Baston and saved those 10,000 soldiers. But in the process, he knew how totally corrupt the command structure of the Allies was and how totally compromised by the banking industry that wanted to have the war continue until 1945. And so he said, when this war is over, I'm going to resign my command and I'm going to run for president and I'm going to expose what's really going on. At that point, the OSS said, we've got a problem with one of our actors and we need to have him taken out. And so there was three separate uh, uh, murder attempts on Patton. Those are described very well in a book called Target Patton. Uh, I covered it in one of my history articles called Overthrowing the Kitten Caboodle. And it, it's under the history tab at my website. I recommend anybody that's interested in getting a broad range of uh, outside perspectives that are re really well researched and founded to go to Faux Science Slayer. Dot com. That's my website. And you can read all these articles that we've been discussing here on uh, geothermal energy, on uh, abiogenic oil production, on global warming fraud, on sustainable energy fraud, on everything you know about history fraud, as well as occasionally, you know, I, I, I get to the point where if your opponent refuses reason, resort to ridicule. And so I've written a dozen satire articles. And I recommend those too. They're they're pretty cute satire articles. One of them is Pinata Planet Syndrome. Uh, one of them is New Amazing Ronco Proxy Croc. If you're one of those scientists who's been stuck in the lab doing things the conventional way, green with envy at those climatologists that are able to fly all over the planet. Well, worry no more. You can get the proxy croc and you can get whatever answers you want to. It's a cute little article. All of those were at, at Canada Free Press. Now you have some opinions on the 911 building collapses and the planes flying into them. Um, what are they? I, I'm a trained structural engineer. In, in the process of becoming a civil engineer, you're, the degree plan requires that you have a dozen or so courses on structural engineering. 
which you know includes statics and dynamics, uh, strength of materials, uh, an interesting course called indeterminate structural analysis which I don't even know if they teach anymore but we'll get to that in just a second and then structural design uh, steel framing design and uh, concrete design foundation design so th that's basically the curriculum the course indeterminate structural analysis you go to the class the first day and you know the professor says I know you're all engineers you've been solving quantitative answers to absolutely everything and at that point we were using slide rules which you know, you can claim slide rules are like, you know, ancient art, but the Wright brothers flew the first airplane in 1903. In 1947, uh, less than 44, they flew in December of 1903. In like October of 1947, we broke the sound barrier. And every bit of those calculations was done with a slide rule. And, and so basically we went from the very first humble attempts at flying to breaking the uh, speed of sound in less than 44 years with nothing but a slide rule. When Apollo 13 ran into problems coming back uh, and, and they had to have an accurate um, calculation done on when to make their burn for re-entry and how long the burn had to be, they had three engineers that worked slide rules because to do the calculations on the computers that NASA had at that time would have taken an hour, and they didn't have an hour. They gave these three engineers. They said, look, we're going to put you in separate rooms. We want you to work out what the uh, physics equation is for the burn time and the amount of burn and come back to us immediately. The three engineers went in the rooms with their slide rules. Each one wrote down their answers. They brought it out. The answers were close enough that they said, all three of these engineers agree, and that's what saved Apollo 13. So don't put down slide rules because the nice thing about slide rules is you have to have a very good intuitive grasp of what your answer is supposed to be because a slide rule can't provide anything other than the three digits. It can't provide you with the scientific notation that goes with it. So you don't know with a slide rule answer whether it's three or 30 or 300. You have to know that intuitively, and you have to know when you're working a slide rule what you're expecting to get in the correct answer. So engineers that worked with a slide rule had a lot more intuitive grasp of reality that they were dealing with than the engineers that just sit around and key punch and go, oh, well, this is accurate to 10 digits. No, it's not. It's not any more accurate than what you had in the way of input information. Matter of fact, it's one digit less than what you have accurate in the way of input information. But regardless, okay, so we're taking this course called uh, Indeterminate Structural Analysis. And he said until 1932, the, there was no accepted method of doing uh, structural calculations for a multi-frame structure. At that time, the American Society of Civil Engineers adopted the Hardy Cross method of moment distribution, where you take a frame and you start putting uh, dead loads and wind loads on the frame, and you distribute those loads down through the grid of the building. But the, comp the, the calculations were so complicated that you could only do a single plane. You, you couldn't do a three-dimensional calculations because you'd just be doing calculations forever. Well, at about the same time I'm taking this class, uh, University of Houston and most other engineering colleges were getting their first IBM 360s, and the professors were down there like mad trying to figure out how to do three-dimensional Hardy Cross moment distribution formulas. And they were working through these formulas, and our professors were coming into class going, my God, we've been over-designing every one of our buildings by at least 25%. Well, the normal safety factor for a building is three times anyway. So if you've got three times and you're adding another 25%, well, then you're already up past four times the amount of uh, load. The buildings at uh, World Trade Center, uh, I had my suspicions when I watched it live during 911, I said, there's no way these buildings failed that way. But I didn't want to think the worst about my fellow Americans and certainly about our leaders. And so I didn't pursue it. And I, I regret that I didn't voice my opinions about it sooner. But, you know, you can only be 
a tinfoil hat conspiracy person for so long over so many different fields, and then people just go, well, you don't have to listen to him because he's a tinfoil hat. Well, when you have the scientific proof for everything that you have a, a very well-held opinions on, then you're no longer a tinfoil hat. You're an expert, and the other people are liars. So we can get, get to that pretty quick. Um, after I got my first article posted at InfoWars, there was a group of people called Architects and Engineers for 911 Truth. They produced an hour and a half long grand jury level testimony DVD on what happened at 911, and they had a premiere in Austin, Texas in May of 2009. I, uh, it was a four hour long event. Uh, Alex Jones got up and spoke for about 45 minutes. Uh, Richard Gage, who's the head of the Architects and Engineers for 911 Truth, got up and spoke. They had uh, copies of the New York City stamped, approved structural drawings for World Trade Center 1, 2, and 7. I'm a trained structural engineer. I looked at those structural drawings. I looked at the newsreel footage that they had of how those buildings were constructed. Uh, I studied them intensively, and it was obvious that these three buildings were brought down by controlled demolition, which involved an enormous amount of pre-planning. I uh, was not convinced that the architects and engineers had the correct means of destruction because they were claiming the buildings were brought down by thermite, and thermite can melt steel. It's been used to weld railroad tracks since 1880. It's an aluminum oxide that when you light it on fire, it burns about 4,000 degrees. So you can take two rails and you can melt the ends together, uh, making railroad tracks. And and so it, it has been used and it has been used in demolition. And the um, Lawrence Livermore Labs in 1998 got a patent for nanothermite which is even more uh more devastating than regular thermite and that's probably what was used but the volumes were just too big for for the level of demolition that happened particularly on one and two so i never joined architects for uh 911 truth they had a second dvd that they premiered in houston in july of 2011 and I attended that two-hour-long event, and after the movie was over, I got up and spoke to the crowd for about 15 minutes, and afterwards I went to uh, dinner at Pico's Restaurant with uh, Richard Gage and other members of the management of A&E Truth, and we discussed it, but I still was not convinced that they had the right information. Then last year, uh, in March of uh, 2014, uh, a website called Veterans Today produced an article called Slam Dunk Most Classified 911 Revealed. And that article they proposed that miniature nuclear bombs were used to bring down the buildings at World Trade Center 1 and 2. And it was compelling. And about two days later, they did another article called VT, V is in veterans, T is in today, flexing its nuclear muscle. That article goes into a great deal of depth about the history of uh, nuclear bombs. The bomb that we dropped on Hiroshima, little boy, was 10 feet long and weighed five tons. Uh, by 1963, Sandia Labs was producing 155 millimeter, which is a six inch diameter artillery shell that were nuclear. They had since managed to make the miniaturization process to the point where they could use just three ounces of plutonium, make a hand grenade size atomic bomb that would vaporize a 10 story building. So basically to bring down 911, they put 10 of those bombs up through the elevator corridors. And then they also used thermite in the hollow outside columns. I did a great uh, interview with one of the editors at Veterans Today uh, James Fetzer at his website, The Real Deal, episode number 31, and that's also up at the Media Broadcast Center website. 
So that uh, video is an hour and a half long, and Dr. Fetzer and I go into a, an enormous amount of detail on the pre-planning and also on the actual construction of the building and how the building fell. Rather than restate all of that, I would just say go visit that. And then if you want some additional information, uh, a video that I highly recommend is called 911 Conspiracy Solved Names connections and details and that's on YouTube and that explains the financial arrangements uh, other things to consider um, able danger was a US Army uh, intelligence operation that had been using the echelon program to monitor emails worldwide and they were uh, very well aware of four of the hijackers and had tracked them uh, they were ordered disbanded in January of 2001 and they were also ordered to be in the Pentagon, in the room that was hit by the missile on 911, and 38 of the 40 members of Able Danger were killed that day. Uh, another bit of evidence of pre planning was a woman who worked for the CIA. Uh, her name was Susan Landauer. She was getting email traffic in May of 2001 that the, there was plans to hijack two airliners and crash them into the World Trade Centers. She notified other agencies, but because she went outside the CIA, uh, she was prosecuted and is the only person prosecuted for crimes during 911 uh, by the U.S. government and uh, sentenced to jail for four years. And she wrote a book about that called Extreme Prejudice. Another bit of information was that four flight schools reported uh, Arab uh, anomalies with flight training and were ordered by uh, FBI and, and DC to stand down. One of those schools was in Oklahoma and their student was a guy named Zacharias Massari. Uh, he had 57 hours of solo of uh, dual time and they wouldn't allow him to solo a two-seater airplane. I soloed with seven hours. So I, I had seven hours of dual instruction, and the pilot said, go do three touch and goes. This guy had 57 hours. They wouldn't turn him loose. He left there and went to Minneapolis. He had been reported in Oklahoma City to the FBI. He went to Minneapolis, went to a place called uh, Pan American Flight School, and said he wanted to take simulator time in a 747. They said, well, <laughs> you can't even fly a, a 150. Why do you – a Cessna 150. Why do you want to fly a 747? Well – I just want to. Well, you know, we have a lot of people that come in here. If you got the money, we'll we'll teach you. And they said, but it's two hundred dollars an hour. He peeled off sixty eight hundred dollars in one hundred dollar bills, and they notified the FBI and said, man, we got this Arab over here that wants to take simulator time. And FBI agent Harry Samet arrested Zakari Masarov on August sixteenth, two thousand one and notified D.C. and said, I need to do a further investigation on this guy. He's got a two-year immigration violation. We don't know where he's getting his money, and it appears that he's involved with the terrorist uh, organization. They said, don't investigate him. Harry was so upset with that that he filed a 26-page report on August 18th with 50 different offices in Washington, D.C., and was ordered to stand down. One of the things that they blame uh, 911 on was the communication failure between the FBI and the CIA. Well, the person who put the firewall between the FBI and the CIA was Clinton, Clinton appointed Assistant uh, Attorney General Jamie Gorlick, who was appointed by Baby Bush to be on the 911 Whitewash Commission. So if you want to have somebody that's going to whitewash things, you pick somebody that was a player. When LBJ wanted to whitewash the, the Warren Commission, he appointed Alan Dulles, mm -hmm. the former head of the <laughs> CIA that JFK had hired to be on the Warren Commission. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. At what point can you not see all of the dots and all of this ugly mosaic. I'm sorry. At some point, you have to say, our government lies about absolutely everything. 
our corporations are all owned by uh, evil monopolists that intend on destroying the whole planet, and they will sell us uh, genetically modified garbage because there's not a single thing that grew naturally on this planet that these deviants don't want to destroy. They will uh, massacre millions like they massacred 200 million during the 20th century with their ignorant wars, and every bit of this is preventable. And I happen to be one of the people who's on the leading edge of thought and, and revolution. And I love that quote, in times of universal deceit, telling the truth is an act of rebellion by George Orwell. And so I'm telling the truth. I can see over the horizon. I can see the thousand years of light. I can see the Eden that humanity with universal freedom can create on this planet. But I also see the enormous evil that's standing in the way. And I've dedicated the balance of my life to doing everything I can to depose these people and to make sure they get the crimes against humanity trials and executions that they have earned. And finally, what can you tell us about chemtrails? Chemtrails, I know for a fact, are being done by our wicked government. And part of the reason is that uh, the... Uh, monopolist big agri groups have developed patents for aluminum resistant plants and there's one of the things that they're spraying the chemtrails aluminum and so they're they're basically trying to poison the planet to the point where only the seeds that they have uh, genetic patents on will be able to survive so they're they're trying to create their own market but there's other things that are involved that, that are related to Morgellons disease. And uh, I, I did a two hour program on Coast to Coast on March 18th. And if you go to uh, coasttocoast.com shows uh, 2015 slash 03 slash 18, it will uh, link up to my website and also my 60 articles at Canada Free Press. But basically, if you've got a, a bunch of evil monopolists and they are involved in pedophilia and child sacrifice and cannibalism and devil worship or, or you know, they're space alien hybrids or they're just plain psychopaths, I don't care what their backgrounds or, or uh, uh, origins are, I'm just – concerned that their motives and their future is going to be horrid for mankind and that if we don't remove this power structure in the very near term they intend to do a genocide that's going to make everything that happened in the past look like nothing i mean mao killed 60 80 million uh stalin killed 30 or 40 million hitler was responsible for 20 million i mean you know this will be billions and that's what they fully intend to do. Uh, I, I'm actually opposed to all of the Abrahamic religions. I, I, I have a real problem with original sin. Every one of these religions has been manipulated and used as a, a basis for human conflict for thousands of years. Uh, I, I wish we had some better way of getting around this particular motif that's been stuck upon us but one thing they say you know and you can look at prophecy as something that's that is given as a guideline or as as an unavoidable future but what they are trying to create is armageddon and the definition of armageddon is the end of the world as you knew it well that has two meanings either Everything that you know and love can be destroyed by a nuclear bomb or uh, bioweapons or, you know, any number of uh, threat vectors that these people now have their hands on. Or you can recognize that the money changers in the temple are evil and they need to be thrown out. And so the end of the world, you knew it, is the end of this fairy tale, false paradigm reality that's bounded by faux science, fake history, filtered news, financed with a fiat currency, and run by demonic warlords. And that's the reality we 
can have and will have when we have universal freedom. Oh, yeah. Anyhow, I've had a great time talking to you, and it's Miller time here in Houston. Yeah, it is here, too. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of the Z-Talk Radio Network. I'll be back. <laughs>